are here today in the third session of our Academy Camp number two on digital approaches in European capitals of culture. So this is an initiative of the Capacity Building for European Capitals of Culture project. So across six different sessions, we're considering a number of different topics about where digital is revolutionising how European capitals of culture and the broader cultural sector, how we're planning um, these European capitals of culture um, and delivering them. My name is Sarah Busa. Um, as Nicole already said, I'm originally from Switzerland, but I'm living in Berlin at the moment. I'm a dramaturg, a theatre maker, I work as a director. And some years ago, I also started um, coding, actually. And I'm still teaching myself how to code and started working with Unity, which is a game engine where a lot of um, developers bring their ideas into existence and build their own games in fictional worlds. And um, also for my theater project um, projects or performative projects, I, I mainly work with AR, which is augmented reality. Um, so for my work and also for the reflection on my work and for the reflection on reality that then becomes my work, um, I see AR as a tool to help me think and analyze and express a thought or a concept. And um, while in my performances, the, the audience are very often asked to dive into fictional spaces and to play in them and act in them, I still like to believe that the performances themselves always also focus on the relationship with reality, like with our perception of reality, our construction, and also, of course, our um, rationalization of it. And, and I think it's important to say that I use AR in public spaces like towns or forests or streets. So the performances I do, they're always like specifically made for a space that already exists. Um, and maybe also a space that people wouldn't really expect fiction or theater at first. And the reason I started working with AR, the reason I, I keep being interested in this technology as a tool to understand is um, the possibility of being able to create this additional overlay to reality and also to be able to situate a thought in the real, like in real surroundings. So it's not a thought or a story that is put in a book and then I can store it away in a bookshelf, but the story or the fiction is rather like placed or placeable in a space of everyday life. So, so I think through these uh, possibilities of location-based AR, the town or the forest or whatever um, place it is, become something like a stage um, themselves. And today I would uh, really like to introduce to you a little bit closer this um, particular idea that everything or basically everything can become a stage, like especially digital spaces, virtual spaces, social media platforms can become stages or of course already are um, stages. St stages. And, um, yeah, another aspect about this, the world is a stage idea, I would like to share is um, the, the possibility of, um, of course, then changing the way we tell a story, because the snippets and fragments of the story can be placed like all over the place, like literally, uh, if the physical space is a forest, but also if the platform uh, is a social media platform like Instagram, where I can distribute like fragments of on different profiles or with different hashtags. And I can really literally leave like these fragments of the fiction or the narrative for the audience to be found. So once I can, for one, I can tell the story in fragments, but then what also happens as a result is that the audience or the player, they get activated. So they um, walk around in the physical space to collect the fragments. They put them together. Um, and they are like activated quite literally um, to, to make sense of what they see and what they encounter. And uh, this, this I really like as an analogy to like our everyday lives where we are always also encouraged to make sense of what we see. So yeah, I think maybe it's important to say that in my performances, I don't really like hand over a preconceived thought to the player or the audience but rather I let them experience like new situations, different roles, and they themselves then define what they mean to them. And of course, like this activity of this almost like co-creation is not only possible in the physical space, but in digital spaces. And we're gonna see that um, in just a bit. And I'm, I'm telling you this all because I think, um, I really think that being like in a space 
lets us think differently about that space and having to change perspectives, like quite literally by looking around, like where to find the next fragment of a story, um, we can also then shift perspectives in a more metaphorical sense. So let me show you two, two examples. Um, here uh, on the picture, you see a player or like an audience member of a piece that's called here and dort, which means here and there, which we realized um, in a small town in Switzerland in 2000, 2018. Um, and here at the moment, the player is trying to convince the high court of alpacas to not kill the entire human race. And she has access to this dialogue, to this like fictional space, of course, through her phone. She's actually looking uh, into the phone, like, like through a window. And so this is one situation happening here. And another situation that is also happening in this picture, you can see that in the background, is a wedding. So to the outside viewer, this could look like as if the player that is actually debating with the high court of alpacas is taking a picture of the bride. So I think this, I, I just want to show you that depending on our knowledge, depending on our perspectives, these are two completely different situations, but they are happening in the same space at the same time. Um, yeah, and I just brought this because I wanted to show that situations and how we understand them and places also how we understand them are always connected to what we know about them and like what we experience um, in them. And so what also happens a lot in, in our performances is something like this. Uh, so <laughs> these are people that what it looks like from the outside are taking pictures of each other while standing in the middle of a meadow in the forest. <laughs> But what they are actually doing is um, they're looking into a fictional space. So here it is a universe, um, like through this window again, provided by the device. Um, and also maybe this is uh, for the Chemnitz team. What I really like about this uh, picture is that it looks like they are seeing something that is invisible. Like they are seeing the unseen. And I thought this is a quite, quite a good match. So I, I brought this picture. Yeah, so by now I mentioned the High Court of Alpacas, the entrance to another universe, and yeah, these are fictional spaces um, that at best maybe lie on top of our everyday surroundings, and that can only be seen like through these devices. But I think, and this is like my hypothesis, um, not only for today, but like for my work, that these fictional spaces are capable of changing the place, like the physical place itself because through introducing fiction and also through making like experiences possible by creating new situations, by providing like new descriptions of the known, and another dialogue about the physical space becomes possible. Um, and this of course then allows a new exchange about spaces and places, especially with people um, who do not yet know the place or have known them like very differently so far. So, so through generating this third, like this fiction, this, this new thing through actually creating what might look like at first more or less like a distance to the physical space and its history, its knowledge that some people have about it and some people don't. By telling this completely different story, everyone, like no matter what background or knowledge, is invited to experience something, something new. And everyone can share their knowledge about what they have experienced just now. No one is left out. No one will have nothing to say. And everyone is kind of like curious again about this specific place. And so another like this new fresh dialogue about these places is made possible through fiction um, as a hypothesis. Um, yeah. And this is also like a dialogue which is then um, especially not defined by who knows what about the history or the politics. Instead, it is really based on what everyone just experienced together um, individually or, um, yeah, or together um, in, this, in this fiction. And that's what I really like about AR in particular, to, to be able to tell these stories that are situated in the real, in the physical space. And now, um, of course, now we are not, um, yeah, we are not outside. And I think this is not only achievable with AR, um, and I'm pretty sure we're gonna see that in some minutes. And by um, overriding the space, um, I, I don't mean like um, deleting what is already there. I, I don't mean trying to forget what is already there. I rather mean like introducing something new. So we have the physical space, we have the common knowledge about this place, and this can differ um, quite widely, but then actually have this, this third, this common space where everyone um, experienced something that they can immediately relate to. And yeah, so that's what I was, was what I was going to say that we're going to have like one first step into the direction of uh, an exploration like this. 
And because we're all on Zoom, um, we are uh, going to try to expand and reorient or try to reorient our perspectives on virtual and digital spaces. And therefore, as I mentioned before, we're going to have like excursions to different digital spaces. And there we're going to figure out like how do these spaces work? What rules and conventions are like defining the space? Um, who do we are? Um, who are we? And who do we get to be? And then in the end, also, we're trying to introduce like a little fiction. We are going to talk about building future scenarios for planning. So a strategic method that we can use for planning. It's a really creative and practical exercise. We're going to have quite a lot of interaction and then develop four different future scenarios in groups. And we're going to talk about those scenarios, um, both in those small groups and then again as a big group as a whole. And to start us off, what is foresight and what is future scenario planning? Well, foresight is predicting what can happen. And this is a bit of a distinction from what will happen. So trying to always be thinking, okay, what's going to happen next year? It's sort of a creative way of thinking, well, what are the possibilities of what's going to happen? Again, it's what can happen versus what will happen. So again, it's thinking of a lot of possibilities. And external scenario planning, it's not thinking about scenarios within you know, your own work, your own lives necessarily. It's quite a big picture activity. It's a strategic planning method that helps you make flexible, longer term plans. And coming back to yesterday, we had um, in the icebreaker this question, you know, do you prefer stability versus flexibility? And here, I think this methodology is really important because when you've actually talked through the possible futures that are likely to happen, you're almost halfway there in terms of finding a solution. If it's in your head, if this is something you're already thinking about, then actually finding a solution, finding a way forward in that context and making the most of the opportunity or overcoming challenges is actually that little bit easier. So this is a really good planning exercise to do. And again, I should emphasize it's really creative as well. And there are not many planning exercises that are really creative. So it's good to make the most of it when they exist. But why should we be using and thinking about using foresight and future scenario planning in European capitals of culture? Well, foresight and, and scenario planning is used in so many different settings, um, often in a military setting. I, as far as I'm aware, that's sort of where it came out of. Um, but it's used, for example, in anything. I don't think it's used as much as it could be in culture, but really I think it should be. Um, because, you know, as a sector, we're always thinking about sustainability, resilience, we're often cut. If there are any economic issues, then generally we're cut first. And this methodology really helps you think about building that resilience and risk management. So assessing that probability of risk, as I mentioned earlier, what could happen instead of what will necessarily happen. It helps you to be really audience focused. So you're thinking about how you deliver for your audiences in a changing social, uh, social context with the idea that you're future ready for their needs. You also communicate better and you're driven by a purpose because you're thinking more ahead of what their needs might be in the future. And around decision making, future choices, as well as better choices about the future now. And when we're in uncertain times, of course, thinking with COVID, we're still a bit like, you know, what changes are we actually back to some sort of normal? Um, this is a way to move forward in uncertainty. And really the reason why we do anything, any sort of planning is to do a better job, to be, um, have more impact and to make sure we're as relevant as possible for uh, audiences. And I think another reason why we should, the uh, European Capitals of Culture should use this because as, um, Sam mentioned yesterday, a lot of European capitals of culture, depending what, like there's different people in the room at different um, levels of uh, delivery. But, you know, when you have several years to plan, this is a luxury not afforded to many people. So actually, this sort of foresight planning can be um, can be really valuable in terms of, you know, seeing you forward through those different years. And our focus today really is on digital programming and community building. And the reason why is, well, it's the theme of the Academy Camp. But also because there are a number of reasons why um, we've been shaken to the core. The cultural sector has been shaken to the core by COVID. We're, again, still in this context of rapid change and we're finding new ways to communicate. And um, like some of those tools we find yesterday, new, ways of, new means of communication, new means of working together. And there are big changes and choices on the horizon, thinking about the environment, for example, like how are we going to really actually meet this in, a, in the short term? Because this is not a long term um, 
uh, which is not a long term question, unfortunately. Um, but there are opportunities that we have to capitalize on. There are th the contributions that we can make. Um, and importantly, thinking about the future um, and how, about digital programming and community building. Well, this how we exist in the future has implications for your audience, how they're included in um, your cultural program, how they participate, uh, what you present, what they co-create, what is curated for them. And another reason, again, creativity. Um, when times are tough, generally people are, as humans, we can find an, um, creative solutions in uncertainty. So this methodology helps us to achieve that. So quickly, what does a scenario look like? Or sorry, any, if there's any questions, please let me know as well. I can't necessarily see hands up, but if um, just you can unmute yourself. What does a scenario look like? Well, or what is it really as well? Uh, a scenario should be concise, it should be usable, and again, creative. It sets out a future that could happen. And in this, there'll be some positives, there'll be some negatives, opportunities and challenges. And in a practical sense, it should be a one or two page description or analysis. A scenario that was published last year by DEN, which is a Dutch institution who we actually work with very closely. And they said that they hope that their scenario serves as the basis for a dialogue with the sector about the implications for the digital strategies. And they focused on Generation Z, for example, as their main audience. Oh, thank you, Yula. Thank you. Um, and so this is one you can also consult, but we'll be developing a different scenario today. And it won't be just about audiences, we'll be developing it. It's more about our digital programs. And this is really what the matrix is that we'll be developing. Um, and so here we have some examples of um, two different factors. We'll be choosing two different factors to help us um, develop our scenarios. And here we have the factors are about social distancing. One is that social distancing becomes the norm after where we are now in the future. Um, and one is about the high cost of digital. And in each of these scenarios, so for example, social scenario one, you think about the factors on these axes, on the axes. So in scenario one, you're thinking about a scenario where you have a high cost of digital tech, but and no social distancing. And so you make your scenario based on that. We'll be going through the methodology together, so don't worry. A scenario example here. So again, this is social distancing remains in place with a high cost of technology. And here we might think, for example, technology doesn't pervade our lives as much as we expected. Um, the environmental costs are actually the costs that hinder innovation. It's not just um, the economic costs as well. The digital divide is in the beginning very wide. Maybe that's where we are right now. But future innovations work with what we have, what everyone has, instead of what we don't have. Cultural events make the most of intimate but distanced in-person events that might be live streamed to audiences across the globe. And education moves outdoors. So do other mass cultural events. But social distance, and this is where we can think about opportunities versus challenges. Uh, we might think more positively versus more negatively, or you might come up with different scenarios within your scenario. That social distance doesn't relate to social distrust. Um, and actually, citizen activism increases in this context. And for example, clears corruption from local politics, and politics actually become more inclusive. But this is just um, a very fast example of what I actually thought, oh, well, what could happen in this scenario? Another good point about um, why this is really beneficial methodology is because actually you bring in a lot of different perspectives. So this was just myself. No one was there to sense check me and say, actually, Nicole, what are you talking about? Local, corrupt, local politics will always be corrupt. What are you talking about? Or local politics isn't corrupt. There is no corruption. Um, but actually, when we do this exercise together, you benefit a lot from the um, diversity of perspectives in the room and challenging each other's um, uh, assumptions and thoughts. So. This is sort of what you end up with. But again, the process isn't finished because after you have the scenario, you have to think about what changes in your work and how you plan going forward. But very quickly, that wasn't actually the overview of the methodology. That was just sort of a rationale behind what we're going to do and why. But now we'll talk about the overview of uh, how to build a future scenario. And there are six fairly simple steps. And we're going to go through all of these together. But in groups, we're going to work to create the future scenarios. But uh, as we're all together now, we will work through the first four steps together. So step one, 
agree your focus. This is on setting the topic and the time frame. This is like your research question. What are you thinking of? And here I'll, uh, we'll introduce what it looks like uh, in the next when we go through it together. Step two is about brainstorming. It's about getting those diverse perspectives in the room. And it's also about doing your research on the external factors of change. So, you know, what research exists? What are other people talking about? What are other experts saying? What is being discussed? Step three, prioritizing. Looking for what's most uncertain or certain and what might have the most impact. And as part of this prioritization access uh, uh, step, I also think about clustering. So clustering different um, factors, maybe generalizing a bit more so you have a bigger perspective. Step four, develop the matrix I showed you. Step five, developing the future scenarios again, which um, that sort of very simple future scenario that I showed you there. And then step six, assessing the implications of the future scenario on your work and planning appropriately. So this is when we start. We are going to agree the focus, the topic and the time frame. For us today, I was thinking that our real focus is on digital programming in European capitals of culture until 2030. Why? Because digital programming has audience, uh, implications for our audiences, how we engage our audiences and how we build communities. There are implications for our budgets. There's a lot of uncertainty as well because we don't know exactly how we're going to move forward post COVID. And because European capitals of culture are delivering before 2030. So there's actually an element of legacy that we can also include uh, in our thinking. My name is Stepan Klenik. A few things about me. I had a longer uh, text there, but I tried to uh, make it uh, short. You know, maybe just because we are here to give you uh, an overview of like what my background is. I studied aesthetics and philosophic faculty at Charles University. And then I continued uh, on Academy of Fine Arts Prague where I studied uh, new media atelier. So this is like my study background. Um, in 2005, we established with my colleague Robin uh, a studio called Brains. Now it's called Brain Studios. There's more studios uh, I will go through later on. And maybe just uh, some uh, personal things. Uh, yeah, I'm a kid of digital era. Even uh, I look quite young on this photo. I'm a pretty old man. Uh, so uh, yeah, uh, you know, we started to play with all the digital gadgets before the Facebook uh, came and Google came, etc. So we were uh, the part of like the the, the rapid development of, of uh, like technology. Uh, and I just uh, I'm pretty technology enthusiast. Uh, that's the reason why I, I skipped from the like the theory of art to the let's say like more practical uh, way of uh, not just talking about the art, but uh, do the art uh, with combination with technology. That's was the reason why I st started to study the new media. I play drums and I, you know what? I have drums in my office, you know, because I can, that's pretty uh, nice thing. So sometimes my colleagues are coming and ask, uh, they ask me to, to play. So I got a drum DJ here in, in the office. Yes, I do sports. Everybody has to do sports. I play uh, badminton uh, for many years. Uh, if you do not play, so you have to try. <clears throat> and I'm a cotter. I, I just have to find this word, what it means. <clears throat> Once you have a cottage <laughs> and you take care of it, you are a cotter. So it's kind of very nice to start to use your hands and learn all the crafts. Uh, and it's just nice to see uh, cut it grass, you know, uh, so, uh, and super personal, I'm married and I do have three kids. So now something about like Brain Studios. Uh, we are a group of uh, independent uh, studios. What it means that we are, we do not belong to any global agency. Uh, we build it up from ourselves and still keeping this role of uh, independency. Uh, 
this is uh, like uh, the structure of uh, studios uh, now three studios disruptive immersive narrative beautiful names uh, and uh, we have our own digital platforms or products I, I would like to talk about so just shortly introduce the brain disruptive disruptive studio uh is offering like innovative communication services it's more like 360 digital communication uh we are helping brands to let's say adapt to the future to to change uh the way they they, they are now on the market we are trying to find the new trends like uh uh, it's more about like the strategy and of course the, the development. Uh, Brain Immersive uh, is a um, creative studio that uh, is offering VR and AR services. It's like virtual reality and augmented reality. I will show you some of the projects. And the newest studio is like a studio for public relation. Uh, it's like typical example of that we had some like let's say partners and suppliers from this let's say PR and communication, but we were not uh, not satisfied. So uh, it's finally uh, let us think of to create our own studio that's uh, doing a bit differently than than let's say traditional public relations. So we are more digital, more let's say story oriented. Uh, and uh, there was uh, one uh, super brand new studio, and that's called Brains Gamify. And we would like to jump into the uh, game development in the virtual reality. This is one of our platform. Uh, it's a uh, virtual cinema, uh, and uh, we invest into helmets. We are helmets. Uh, so it's kind of, let's say, some combination of uh, hardware, rental, and our own software that uh, allows to to synchronize uh, content sharing. So it is some 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 more features, and uh, we are using it for uh, using it for festivals, for example, if they if they want to offer some uh, content in virtual reality. So uh, this then develop into uh, our uh, projects. I would like to talk about called Brelando. Uh, uh, we'll mention later on. So, just a uh, short overview. We have a lot of uh, clients. Um, the, the corporate clients, big uh, global uh, brands, uh, and small startups or international startups. So, it's really like a mixture uh, of variety of, of clients. Like, shortly, what we do offer is uh, let's say the, the, the intro uh, uh, once we once we are having an um, open discussion with client we uh, most of the time rewrite the brief uh, they are sending us so we started from the scratch so we do the trend research we are coming with some ideation new concepts then once we are having this part you know we can move to for example like the bending or, or just uh, changing the, the visual uh, communication and concepts we do the uh, development so we have a, a programmers here uh, multi-platform so it's, uh, from like web to applications and then once we are for example building up the the product or service or the whole brand for the client we we, we can offer uh, to do the communication uh, in the online, even offline environment. And yes, or we said that uh, we are doing AR and VR experiences and uh, 360 video production and post-production. There's like 40, uh, 40 plus uh, colleagues uh, uh, in uh, our studios now after COVID, it's kind of changing. There's more of external participants. So like, we still keep the offices, as I have to say, and because really a lot of people are working from home. We did, let's say, very uh, non-business step. And uh, instead of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, like, decrease our offices uh, we uh, we have a one new floor with the garden because we just wanted to offer to our colleagues to just enjoy the summer on the garden and make them even more happier 
stayed in the office. Uh, so yeah, we, uh, we are settled in Prague, Czech Republic. Uh, yeah, that's what I haven't said. So there's a lot of uh, idea makers, designers, thinkers, engineers, developers, product managers, uh, something what I call like multidisciplinarity. And you know, this is what I love to keep here in the environment. So more of different people uh, uh, and definitely it's not ju just about like what, what uh, uh, is their professional career, but what they just love to do. And for example, this is, uh, uh, this is kind of a DNA of, of brains. We just love culture, as you said. <laughs> it's my like uh, uh, whole life. And we supported a lot of projects uh, during the, the, the uh, brains uh, history, uh, from festivals to some music projects, film artists, or uh, like other, other events. Uh, maybe I will go shortly through some of them. I know. Uh, Nicole, I'm probably be longer than 10 minutes. Sorry for that. So I'll try to be faster. So uh, National Gallery Prague website, uh, and National Gallery is the biggest culture organization institution in, in, in Czech Republic. It was just a dream with my background. It was just a dream to work on such a project. And it was not like... Uh, it's the same, like they ask us to build up the website, but we started to talk about like uh, how the audience change, what are the needs of the institution. So we were, we worked more on the vision than on the website. The website is just, just the cover and uh, who it serves because it serves the institution, it serves the visitors, users. What is the uh, actual contemporary visitor? I do have a part of uh, this for the open discussion kind of interesting, like uh, who we are talking to. Then, uh, for example, this is the uh, the new independent cinema in, in Prague. We like uh, helped to, let's say, start five years ago. And it was kind of funny because a lot of people said like, hey, are you super crazy? You are like just trying to do the independent cinema in the times of Netflix and HBO, you know, can never survive, it's total nonsense. But uh, it was not about the building the cinema, it was about the building the community and it's super successful cinema. Shame of COVID, of course, but you know, that's the way because to share experiences is the most important things. That's what art is, it's just language. And once we share things together, that uh, that what helps what I said, like the critical thinking, and that's what the core of the art is to help people to understand different languages. So, uh, other project is uh, the culture center in Prague called SLED. This is the Museum of Working Class Movement. Uh, we participate on the Culture City uh, present 2015 with the whole digital communication. We participate in a few European projects with universities uh, from Germany, HFG and the ZK and Centrum Karlsruhe, and uh, some so like Spanish partners too. And now just uh, what are the like actual uh, projects we do and we work on. Uh, in uh, the AR and, and VR. Uh, this is the Signal Festival. It's, um, they call it like the biggest festival in Czech Republic because it's, um, it's a festival of light being in a public spaces. And uh, uh, they, uh, they, they count uh, visitors uh, uh, throughout the mobile data. So they, they said that it's like a half a million, half a million uh, participants. They, they just go and, and see the, these uh, lightning objects. And we are now for this year doing the very first uh, augmented reality uh, trip. So it's, it's, it's like a, a trajectory that goes through Prague and you have like six uh, 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 local, like, space specific installations in AR. They are mapped on the projects with like six uh, artists. So hope is gonna function. So this is like a gamification of one of the project. 
so it fits to the like overall place. So this is like one of the projects. Uh, again, it's uh, uh, for the very first time. And as we know, that there is no other festival that has like this kind of uh, AR, uh, AR experience, like multiplied AR experience um, uh, in the city. So this is the projects we did for the Czech radio. Uh, and it was about the, uh, uh, the Russian army when 1968 came to, to, to Prague. And we just did this uh, experience once you are, uh, you are a person that's on the ground and tank is coming onto you. And this like storytelling, uh, once you feel the atmosphere of the uh, uh, of the tank coming to you, and in the same moment there is a second view. Once you are the driver of a tank, and you have to drive through the man, so it's kind of this let's say storytelling, not just how we feel when the Russian car came, but how the soldiers uh, felt when they had to let's say kill us or most our lives. This is other project for uh, Olympic Games. It's like the, let's say, very visual way how to show the history of Czech Republic in a VR. So uh, very fast. And this is the call, uh, this is the project called Prelando. Our latest projects are on startup. Uh, two years ago, we started to experimenting with, uh, let's say, new, uh, new version experience of music video. So we, we did like a 360 uh, uh, video clips. It was not just a documentary of playing, but we, we adapt everything to, to this kind of very intimate experience. But uh, when the COVID came, you know, we said like, this is because uh, of course, once you can attend any, any concert, uh, we had, let's say, a uh, solution that is like we are headset, so we came to a Prague and asked them if they would, don't want to support like this uh, um, music industry uh, segment, and if they can help us, can help us, and they said like we are sorry because uh, music bands are private entities, but let's let's talk about the theaters. So we adapt now it's twelve uh, theater plays for a 360 format, but it's the very different thing is that there are some projects that are having the 360 uh, theater played, but it's more a documentary, but we really reinstated all, all uh, for the VR. So it's like scenography, uh, script, dialogues, lightnings. So uh, everything was changed for, for the 360 experience. And uh, yeah, uh, we uh, used our uh, VR cinema platform. So uh, we offered people to uh, buy tickets. And once you buy tickets, the next day, uh, the taxi is coming to you and, or delivery service and bring you not just the ticket, but uh, also the, the VR helmet. So you can you could enjoy the uh, theater uh, installation in, in your place at home, and then the next day, the delivery picked up uh, again the VR helmet. So it was kind of the, the solution for the COVID times when you have a, a different experience. And what I we would have to say that it's not like a saving uh, theaters from the COVID, and that was the reason why I said like we started two years ago with the music videos. For us, it's a totally new format. It's different experience. It's super authentic, super autonomy, super intensive. And what I have to say is just you have to try it. Uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, positive reviews. So people are writing us back, like how, how they like it and how they enjoy it. Because again, I think we are more um, formulating a new type of experience than just to uh, save, let's say, uh, uh, the culture uh, and uh, find a solution uh, from the COVID. And this is just the last slide, it's kind of funny. This is not a COVID, 
this is how Martin Emir writes about the company function. And in this company function, it means like every project you have to think of. It's about like the way uh, you think about your brand, about your communication. And it's just very nice to see yourself or any activity you do and like a reflex what you have done till these times and just help you to restructure and redefine all the activities you were doing uh, uh, till now. So uh, COVID just brings us, the, let's say, the startup thinking and it doesn't matter even if it influence your company or not, just a, a nice uh, possibility to, to, to redefine what have you been done doing uh, till the COVID. And this is just a fun picture at the end. This is what you see once you write startup in, in uh, image photo bank. And this is one, what you see if you write startup and COVID. Hi, my name's Sam. Um, I'm director of programs for Threshold Studios and for Frequency, which is an international festival of digital culture. So I'm just going to talk really briefly about who we are and what we do, because I'd like to sort of take the approach of talking about some of the approaches that we use in our work to see if it's helpful with what you're developing. So at the heart, we're a creative and cultural agencies that use digital technologies as a place for change. And two of the key projects that we're running are, one is Frequency Festival, which is 10 in this year, which is a radically inclusive international festival of digital culture, which is hosted in the city of Lincoln in the UK, which is a space which is a combination of historic and also contemporary space as well. So it's been really amazing to see that city space change. And we present work that uses digital technologies in non-traditional spaces. So we've used heritage sites, streets, shopping centers, car parks, underground sites. We basically go across the city for, originally it was 10 days and then four days. And then the second project that kind of that feeds into what I'm talking about is a project called Digital Democracies, uh, which is a two year R&D testing program that's about development of digital work for public spaces. We were finding that in terms of digital work for public outdoor spaces, projection mapping had worked really, really well. Um, but in a lot of spaces, the spectacle of this was becoming cost prohibitive for a number of cities and for a number of sites. And our work focuses a lot on those spaces that are probably outside our major cultural hotspots to make sure that we're creating democratic audience offers, but also that we're thinking about events and work that works in a holistic setting through creating festivals that nurture talent development, or we work with local authorities to look at economic impact and how cultural activity can benefit place. So given that this talk is about digital, <laughs> I just wanted to start at the point of this conversation of defining what I'm talking about when I talk about digital, because I think when last year happened and we hit this tsunami, this online tsunami, and we were talking a lot about the rapid development of digital, it was really clear that people were talking about digital in a number of different ways. So when I'm talking about digital, I'm not talking about digital specifically as a backend operating system, as a way to coordinate teams, and I'm not talking about it purely in the sense of online programs or social media and communications. There's two things I want to talk about in the presentation. One is I want to talk about how you can use digital data that's housed in a space to develop cultural programs that support these ambitions of place and also give you a means to evaluate and create legacy from work and actually does make your program and communications work together better. And the other one is about some of the work that we're producing that's using digital technology in public space. So when we talk about there's been talk about hybrid works, which maybe go between online spaces and physical spaces, but the work that we've been programming for 10 years is specifically using digital technology in a number of different ways in an exhibition setting. So I hope that's okay. Um, so I'm going to start with the first one. I'm going to start as data as a means to develop cultural programs, achieve audience objectives and support ambitions of place. And really, this is a bit of an overview process map of how you can start to approach the idea of putting an event or a program or a longer term program in place and 
it starts from your vision and aim. It starts <laughs> in our case, it tends to start with really big pieces of paper and felt tips and locking yourself in a room with countless cups of coffee until you find a vision and an aim that you feel really resonates. As an organization, we've been going for 23 years and we've always had a social purpose to our work. We've always been about connecting people in place, creating wider opportunities. So we knew then when we were creating larger and public scale events that we were gonna embed the core values of the organization, but we were gonna think about how we amplified that and how we used that to create models that could then travel to different places and achieve that on a wider scale. So yeah, start with what you wanna do, because then also as well, if you start with what you want to do, you'll know if you've done it by the time you get to a review point. And there's a question at this point of well of who are our important audiences? And this is where later in the process, this will start to ease some of the, the, the mechanisms between your communications channels and your programming as well. But it also gives you the sense of who are we creating this for? And you can break that down into a primary, secondary and tertiary segment but it gives you the means to be able to understand who you're creating it for, their potential characteristics and how you can reach them, and also create those benchmarks for how you can start to increase those segments or how you can start to work with those segments in different ways. And then for us as well, which may not be right for some, is we think about what difference will we make? We apply a theory of change model to our projects. It's a bit of an adapted theory of change model. We don't kind of use the full academic breakout, but we start from the point of what's the change that we want to see. So really we, oh God, I hope this doesn't sound arrogant. We try and inspire ourselves with what we're trying to do. So we feel excited to start that process. And then we start to get more into the nitty gritty of it because we've identified our audiences and, you know, out of those audiences, some may be public, some may be sector facing in order to think about the legacy of the work. But we start to gather profiles of who are our audience characteristics and how do they communicate? And then we think about what are the segments that we're identifying for growth? So these may be segments that we know we're going to get a lower engagement with in the first instance, but we can start to think about how we program, how we create partnerships to nurture and stimulate that growth. So for one example, when Frequency Festival first started, our dominant segment was 18 to 35. And we knew that would be our dominant segment because the university was a key partner. We were operating more in the end of the city that that audience tended to migrate to or where there was more of a commercial and cult, more of a commercial offer for them. But then in subsequent years, what we started to do was create partnerships with heritage sites at the opposite end of the city so we were still programming digital work for heritage sites we were working with Lincoln Cathedral and Lincoln Castle but what we were doing is we then operated a festival trail which meant that we were creating a point of entry for heritage audiences which were typically over 60s talked about as empty nesters um, in some of our UK audience profiles that maybe they have children who've left home, they have more free time, they have more disposable income. They don't really engage with social media, but they know the places that they like to visit. They know that they're attached to a lot of Heritage England organisations. So what we did there is we started to programme work in those spaces to encourage a migration across the city and create a point of access in our program. So subsequently in the year after that segment became our fastest growing segment. Year after that, we applied a similar methodology to families and increasing our family friendly focus. So it's thinking about the, the base, the people who are coming to your event, the people who are coming to your cultural activities and thinking about how they might behave. And then the key part of that is what benchmarking can we gather? So what can we start with of how many audiences of those are coming to the place or how many we're engaging currently? And then how can we see where we're achieving what we're setting out to do? So that's, you start with your day, start with your vision, you work through your data, you find out what you know. And a lot of this is test and explore. It's not about getting it right, but it's about approaching audiences with a bit more a bit more of a fully rounded thought than just kind of place in a cultural program. 
But then there's also the part as well of your actual cultural program. How does that work and how does that feed into your objectives? So say, for example, you want people in place to have more stake and more authorship over the work that you're creating. So it's natural to foster co-collaborative longer term projects that work with grassroots organisations. So perhaps you start with an artist call out over six months over a year um, that actually leads to a commission that means that those communities see themselves as artists within the festival or within your event. Um, structure and principles as well. That's how long, how big, how much is it going to cost? How many people do you need? And starting to put that nuts and bolts around it and thinking about how your programme reaches audiences. We partner with cultural venues and cultural spaces but in the main, we focus on public areas. Our commissioning work and our exhibition work focuses on public spaces because those are the spaces we know that everyone has a right to act with the agency that they choose. They don't have the same barriers to cultural spaces or cultural organisations that we may have perceived potentially. So in the first three years of the festival, we saw our audiences who hadn't engaged with culture before increase. And then in the fourth year, we saw that number decline. And the reason we saw that number decline is because they'd started coming to the festival and they'd made the festival part of their cultural calendar. So we had a small panic that we weren't achieving an objective, but then we realized that was us that was affecting the objective. And then the other thing to think about is your evidence, the economic impact that you have. And you will also think about how I've gone too far, I can't go back, excuse me. Um, think about the additional opportunity that is available through your programme. For 10 years, we've been running an internship scheme alongside the festival. So over, this is going into our 10th years, but we know over the nine years we've been running it so far, over 70% of our interns have gone into creative jobs or um, employment or training linked to their field as a result of working with us. Over 90% of the program have gone on to education, employment or training that we've helped with through references. So it's just thinking about the additional opportunity within your event to, to nurture and to support place. Um, and then there's a lot of talk at the moment about actually, in terms of making your case, how do you measure your social value? This is where evaluation partners are really helpful because your economic impact represents the pound in the space, but your social value represents that social pound, that difference that you're making to your spaces, places and people. And as well, that's a really good narrative for the development of your reputation, reach and impact and will all be evidenced through your benchmarking, which takes us back to that second point of putting that framework in place. So I hope, hope that's all making sense so far. I've done, I've done a bit of an overview of how, how this works and how this can start to work with a team because a lot of the times with cultural programming, you... You have the artistic team set in the program and then they pass that to the marketing team and the marketing team have to work out how to make that program stick, how to make that program work, what social media channels. But if you've developed a program that really focuses on heritage spaces and the audience that you're going to start with, they're potentially not using Twitter. They're definitely not using Instagram. They're definitely not using TikTok. Um, they may be using Facebook but it gives you that fighting chance. So this is where you see that process laid out of, this is where your vision and objective starts. That will be the opt-in that you're asking from, from your partners, from people who are working with you, from your artistic program. And actually this vision and objective becomes a way to develop those multi-sector partnerships as well. Um, don't just think about cultural programs. How can you embed the tech sector into it? How can you work with your destination management and tourism how can you work with your HEI and FE organizations and that all really starts from developing a vision and objective that they can see their own outcomes within and then here your data benchmarking and analysis start with what you know start with what you're going to measure um, develop your brand identity think about those vision and objectives and think about the visual and the feeling and the tone that you're going to create you know if if you want to be a democratic 
public facing um, vehicle, don't embed yourself in contemporary art language. That's not going to mean much to the everyday. Think about how you would speak to a family. Think about how you, but also how you could potentially create different routes for people with different interests. Like if you are looking to develop a more sector focused arm, maybe you're concentrating sometimes more on the technology or more on the partnerships and the mechanisms. And that strand of your program will have a different language. But it all starts from, I'm pointing, and there's no one can see, still getting used to being in online spaces after a year. But this middle part here is this is where your information sits and this is where you start to work with your artistic team and you start to work with your marketing and communications team to develop the actual program, the actual product, what, what your program will look like. And then you embed a consistent process of evaluation and impact in. We talked about, you know, the title of this presentation was user-led culture because actually tech and design gives us some useful tools on the cultural side that we can use. And one of those key things is user-led design. If you're working on a collaborative commission over a year, use those participants as your user-led focus or test it with an audience in the first instance and get feedback. And if that feedback is, this is terrible, accept it, change it, move on from it. Um, but embed, don't think about evaluation as something that you do at the end. Think about those touch points that you can build into a program to keep testing, to keep refining. Build it into your communication strand that you want to keep this conversation open, that this is an event about people with people. So that's my overview about how you can use digital in that sense in terms of creating a program and then the other thing that I touched on really briefly is that we use digital as part of our exhibitions as well so I just I've put together a couple of case studies and two of these we're doing at the moment we hope apologies that's a lot of text but it's getting made at the moment so we don't have any visuals of it yet there's been much pivoting in this year of how we approach work but this is a partnership project. Um, it's actually um, a transnational project, um, trans-European project between a number of partners. So the creation process has all been digital. The exhibition, the research that has been conducted to feed the programme has all been digital. And the premiere will be the first time it's hosted in public space. So there's learnings within this that we've had to... We started from a commission call out. We started in a very typical way that we do to create work. Um, but we made sure when we were selecting artists that they, they had that ability to be flexible. And we found that a lot of artists working with digital technologies have that ability to pivot. They're not as fixed as, as those working in gallery spaces. So this program uses, um, this project uses uh, testimony from survivors who have moved from their country and also from the people who are working with those people who are in those systems and it's a two-year research project but our part in that project is to create a public exhibition piece that connects people with the idea of the principles of the project so there's a politicized element to this project and obviously thinking about public space and thinking about the people and stories that are housed within the project and the respect that we want to show to people who've contributed to it. We're having to think about how we amplify the principles of this research in a public space without creating an overly political bias or an overly political narrative. So we knew that what we want to do is focus on that idea of humanism and that idea of shared experience. So audiences can bring an intersectional understanding to the piece, but the intersectional understanding will start from the point that we've all shared. And one of the points that we've all shared is trauma, trauma or stress without actually bringing trauma into the space. We want to use visuals that focus around the body. And we're also using, we're also trying actually, trying and testing because this will then become part of a one year touring program. Updating the idea of a cantastoria, which was an Italian tradition, which used storytelling and pictures in public spaces. So we're looking to see what the digital update for that could look like. So we're using interactive visuals. We're also working with uh, a choir leader who uses phonetics as a way to teach music. 
So as the piece tours, it can tour essentially as a USB stick and as an audio vocal score that could travel to international countries and be replicated in other spaces. So whatever challenges we're facing in terms of our own mobility, whatever ch chances we're facing in terms of moving kit, we're trying to create a piece that houses a lot, but can be moved in a very small way. Um, I'll share some pictures of it once it's done. Sorry, I know it's not so exciting when it's all text, but I think when you're working in public space and there's a potential, potential political tension, it's important to think in your program of how you, how you deal with that. The second one that we're working on at the moment, oh, sorry, no, actually, this is an older version. But again, this is something that was driven by research. So it involved HEI partners. Uh, it also involved healthcare partners. And the principle of this project was about connecting people to the idea of aging. And in the first instance, it was about flagging up the difficulties with later life care in this country and how expensive it was but it was also about challenging attitudes to morbidity that um, we tend to see the later half of life as an access point to death whereas the researchers we were working with were saying this is one of the best points of my life I'm free of responsibility <laughs> I'm not I'm still present I'm still compass as I have a lot of have a lot of experience I have a lot to share like please just don't don't do that to me. So Lindsay created a VR piece, which you, in the picture you can see, this is where we, this is one of our heritage sites. So this is Lucy Tower at Lincoln Castle. There's a challenge in presenting work in heritage sites in the sense that you can't touch anything. <laughs> it can get really expensive. So you have to work with technical teams that kind of understand the sensitivity of that space. But what we did is we presented this work and then we created some wraparound activity that connected people to the wider narrative. And one was someone walking around the city who picked up conversations with people, took them for a cup of tea, and then actually wrote a piece called The Manifesto of Care, which is still touring. So we found people at a point when they were inspired and engaged them into a call to action to keep that work going. And then I was aware I'd pick kind of two pieces of work that dealt with quite heavy issues. So I just wanted to share this. This is an invisible man. It's a, a two piece walk around theater um, performance. And actually with the digital pivot that's been happening in the last year, now we have to do all our festival outside. It's meant we can engage with new art forms. And one of the new art forms that we can engage with is street theater. And street theatre has a really beautiful, organised chaos to it. They are some of the bravest people I think I've ever met in my life because this just involves walking up to someone and getting started, getting going. But this piece is really interesting because there's, there's a thing of, you know, I gave two examples of work that you can commission, but this is also work you can book. So you don't have to create and commission every single part of your program when you know there's an audience segment that needs that attention. And actually, we've booked this for this year because one of the things we use is footfall counters in the city to um, understand where places are, understand where we've made a difference to footfall. But because we take a data led approach and essentially over the last two years, most data has been wiped out we're now looking at how we can rebuild our data sets. And one way we can do this is through using street theater and walkabout performance to get quantitative evidence of where people are in the city. And also if it's booked in one space and that part's dead, move to another part. So this is that thing of where program can inform those objectives and you can sort of think on your feet in that way. Because another thing that, these artists innovate, these artists innovate massively. And I, I, I think there's a potential for a dialogue of how we, as city spaces, how as our local authorities or business groups, we work more with them. There was a piece that we had in 2017, which was uh, remote control street furniture. So it was two bins and a cone that was controlled in secret by remote control by a set of artists, which people loved. Again, they could move around the city. But there's a development of those work going on that those um, bins are now being fitted with um, an AI facial recognition technology that maps smiles in the city. So 
that's at a beta test stage at the moment and the artists are working on those so what we're hoping is that in the next couple of years we can start to build some of our quantitative and well-being data set by using remote control bins so the potential <laughs> the potential in this is huge um so yeah that's that's my that's my overview really that's using data and digital to create program that's using digital to build a program and these are all our channels so if there's any more you want to find out or if you want to have a look at any of our stuff or see how the festival grows in a pandemic year then please do what is an online community and in what ways are online communities distinct from communities in the real world uh, i think it's a really good question because we are we are a bunch of human beings right and i guess our needs and uh, skills and you know exchanges uh, in a sense do not differ so much but we will see when we go through the uh, upcoming slides that there are huge differences actually because we uh, have to rely on certain technologies um, there is a language component that is interesting and so forth and so forth. So there are actually many, many different things that uh, play out when it comes to online community. Um, and I guess um, there's a, I would, I would say there's a huge, a huge distinction between um, meeting online and meeting in real life and building something, but it's absolutely possible to unfold um, group energy and to keep a community going both online and offline or maybe in a hybrid sense because that's probably the thing that we will have to face also in the coming years um, because of the pandemic so I guess all of these forms will stick with us this is like these next slides is really something um, you will get the, this presentation in, and you are invited to create for yourself a checklist um, where you have like listed and, and ready to share with everyone what is important for your community, for your com common goals and culture. Because I, I guess this is like, that's the ultimate starting point. So if we talk about creating uh, or building a pan-European <clears throat> maker community, I guess my first question would be, um, what, what's the common goal of that? Um, what's important for the people in that community? And what kind of culture do you anticipate um, in, this, in this group? I think these are uh, questions that are entirely non-technical. They don't have anything to do with um, platforms or modes of organizing. But these are the very human uh, and self-organizing questions that I think are really important to start with. So maybe you can just take all these prompts as and create your own personal checklist um, for yourself. Yeah, first of all, I think uh, one of the one of the very basic thing, and it sounds obvious, but uh, I also think it's it's actually not that easy is getting the right people on board. So if this is really about uh, creating a community of makers, then my question would be, who who should be who should be in that group? Who are the relevant contributors and stakeholders? Um, how to be inclusive? and diverse, while at the same time also making sure that this group um, has, um, you know, has, has a certain common understanding where you can actually also get work done. So can you be really, can you be like 100% inclusive for everyone who is interested or do you need a certain protocol to onboard people? And then the question, or maybe as a, as a guideline that I find useful, is the question or is, is, this, is this prompt that says everyone who is affected by a decision should have the right to decide, or in that case, to, to be on board. So now the question is, who is actually affected by the formation of a maker community? 
because obviously not all the makers you want to address can be part of that community. Or maybe they can, but in various levels of involvement, because not everyone probably wants to vote or can vote. And not everyone wants to have like a, a very high level of participation. So there might also be people that are happy to read um, to read uh, on Twitter or LinkedIn or other platforms to read, just read about it. And then others really want to be more involved. So I would say this would be my number one question, how to make sure that you get the people on board. What's the architecture of people that you feel has to be in this, in this community? How can you reach out to them? And how can you make sure that you, that, that really those people that you feel will carry the community forward are there? And this is a question that it's not easy to find a standardized answer to, because obviously it's all a matter of knowing people. When you don't know them, of course, you need to convince them. So you need to have a good pitch. Um, and there might even be contradictory people and contradictory opinions, which to a certain extent can be very healthy for a community. But there's also a tipping point when too much controversy is starting to create damage. So this is a very, it's a very touchy subject. What I very often do when I help organizations to start a new thing is to create a map, some sort of um, maybe an or not an organ, an, not an organigram. It's just the opposite of it, actually, because it's more decentralized. But this is where uh, we start creating a map of the people that we trust and that we really see there, like maybe creating a core group, and then from this core group starting to move to the outer, the outer circles, and. While inside this group, there's an extremely high level of involvement and possibly even decision-making, the more you move outside to the outside layers, the, um, the involvement becomes less. But still, there can be very relevant people being even in the margins of such community. But maybe for the reasons of time or whatever, they can't be as involved as the others, but they still can be evangelists. They still can be on an advisory board. They can be really important faces of that movement, even though they are not, um, uh, for time reasons, part of the, of the core team. And vice versa, you might have people who are very active in the inner circle, but mainly help with uh, administrative or technical things but they are nonetheless important because without them, the infrastructure wouldn't work. So this is really, this is an invite for um, envisioning, um, envisioning this group of people in an architectural sense that, as I suggested, where you start with a core team and then the different layers and all the people involved can start with the people they trust most. And that's usually a really good exercise because uh, if, you, if you put such a white paper on a wall, uh, you might easily end up with 80, 90, 100 people. And very often we don't realize how many people we actually know or others from our group know. And um, that's a very, a very useful exercise because once you know whom you would like to have in that team, you can think of how to address people. How are you going to do it? Do you write emails? Do you have personal meetings? Do, do you think of even making a retreat for kicking this off? Whatever makes sense for you and for your community, this is very individual. But yeah, that's, that is uh, maybe the, the number one starting point. Do you have any questions for me at this point? Any remarks maybe? Feel free to jump in whenever you feel like, right? So maybe, could I ask yeah. a question? Sorry. Please, um, please. Maybe we'll come to this later, but um, the way I really like how you're defining the, the sort of the core versus the people who are still important, but maybe not involved every day or involved, involved even that visibly, but who, as you say, may have a role to play. 
I wonder, do you have any tips about the people who aren't as I, involving those people who aren't as involved? Because I think when you're less involved from something, when you're more abstracted, it's much easier to say, oh, I don't need to do anything or um, I'm not as important or even to lose the, the will and say, oh, I'm not so important. They don't really need me. How do you engage that sort of how do you engage people to be involved, even if they're not too involved and keep them engaged, maybe? Yeah, I, I think there might be two answers to that. Uh, answer number one would be by offering interesting things that uh, keep people, you know, sticking around. This can be events. It can be a really interesting Discord channel where uh, you find a lot of links. It can be a newsletter. It can be many different outlets. Uh, there is, and, and that's also the problem, right? We will get to that because there is so much and there are so, so many different options. Um, but uh, it, it might be the, 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 the one, the one uh, perspective might be content offers, newsletter, um, interesting channels, whatever. And the other option might be to give these people a specific role, because very often um, people have no idea what's expected from them. And those who build the communities somehow shy away from being very specific what they expect, right? Because uh, and that that, of course, creates friction and uncertainty. So um, what I find useful, especially for those people that you would like to uh, become evangelists of your cause, but of which you already know won't have the time, you can always ask them to maybe join an advisory board <clears throat> or becoming a testimonial um, and uh, using your example in all the presentations they give, what they usually do, because then they have a very clear task and they know that it's not expected from them to, you know, to take part in each and every meeting. Uh, because very often this is simply not possible. But I think it can be really both. It can be creating specific roles. And the other option is, um, you know, tying people to your platform by coming up with interesting content. I mean, these, these are the two things that I like that come to my mind. That makes sense. Yeah, super. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, and the next two uh, uh, prompts, they actually, they, they very much belong together. So choosing your communication platforms. And that's always, it's one of the hardest things. Um, and it's really most, it's one of the trickiest thing in, 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 in community building because uh, there is a tendency of sort of outsourcing each and every human problem to technical platforms. And I think we have all come to understand uh, in the year 2021 that human problems um, do not first and foremost require technology, um, but require human ways of, of solving them. The technology can be really helpful, that can provide the framework, but uh, what we actually need is social technology, but we get to that later. But this is something I think is, is super important because um, really this depends on uh, the language of people, where they come from. There might be regions in the world where specific uh, social media channels are not accessible. There might be parts of the world where bandwidth is not as easily accessible as it's here. Um, there might be tools that you don't want to use because of this <laughs> tech is not neutral, I would like to say. And there might be people that um, have concerns about using, uh, for instance, Facebook or using Zoom. Sorry, I use it too. Uh, this is not a critique uh, for your choice of platform. If I would have to organize an event like you, I would have used Zoom as well, uh, simply because the alternatives are very often not stable enough. But nonetheless, it is an issue, right? And we can't say that these platforms are entirely neutral. Uh, they they sort of, um, yeah, they have access to our data. Um, it's, it's very often entirely unclear what is happening to our data. 
uh, if we use social media platforms such as Facebook or Twitter, uh, we don't have a say in the terms and conditions of how our data is being used, but we produce all the value, right? I mean, I don't want to argue from a moral perspective whether this is fair or not. That's a, that's a completely different discussion, but uh, I just want to, I, I, you know, I, I just to, to be very clear about it might even be that people will decide not to join your community because your choice of platforms doesn't meet their expectation. This might happen, right? There might be people saying, no, if you, org if you are organized in Facebook groups, I'm out because I, I have abandoned Facebook, you know? So I, I will not be able to join you. So there will be, this will be a question how to get organized and what is like the minimum level of, let's say, yeah, standards of data security, um, of privacy that you think you have to provide or you want to provide to your members? I think this is really a question we can't, we can't ignore anymore. It's, it's just, um, it's not doable. And um, if people, you know, I, I, I know how it is because using alternatives for, for all these platforms requires more time. It's sometimes really a pain uh, simply because a lot of the open source products, they don't deliver uh, in a way as Google does or Zoom does. But uh, I guess we will soon come to a point where we really have to make a decision whether we, you know, yeah, where we have to take a decision um, about uh, safety and privacy also for our members. And then I think it will be a question. And then people might be uh, also become a little bit more open towards, instead of Google Drive, maybe using a Nextcloud instance. Um, instead of Google Docs, maybe using CryptPad. You know, I, I'm also working with all these products, but I, I would like to see us <clears throat> trans slowly transitioning also in this other world that is more open source, that is more privacy friendly and data respectful, because that is certainly going to be an issue. So these two things, and oops, uh, and we will talk more about platforms, right? This is rather, uh, uh, this is a very, um, this, this is a, an overall prompt, but we will get, we will break it down to where platforms really become necessary. But this is like a number one thing. Um, what are the platforms that you, that you feel, no, no, we are not going to work with them uh, or which are the ones you really want to see. And very often talking about the project architecture, what we see is um, that communities need an internal structure of getting organized. Very often they even they, they either use Google Drive uh, where they store all their documents or Nextcloud is becoming more and more popular. Um, um, and then it's also the question of how to communicate. So you either need Zoom or Big Blue Button or Jitsi as open source solutions. And then of course, the website and then the messenger services. This is another big question. Telegram, Slack. What is it that you want to use? Maybe Discord. For some communities, Discord is the, is the best solution. So there is a whole lot to um, reflect and think about, um, but we will get a little bit to more detail in a second. Another thing is, of course, this is also super big. It's mega, mega big. <laughs> Creating a framework for governance. What does governance mean? Governance simply means steering a project together. And it entails, of course, collective decision making. It entails access, participation, and also the right to vote. So, what Community Rule Info does is to create a really nice tool set that helps you to reflect the governance in your own community or organization. Because it comes up with a lot of good questions and tools and it helps you to create like a, a governance paper that uh, potential members can take a look at. So 
typically in such a governance paper, we have information on how often do people meet, what are the levels of involvement, we talked about that before, how does decision making work, who can decide on what, how do we vote, how participatory is this entire community, who represents whom, and of course, how can we solve conflict. Conflict re resolution is really one of the, of the most important things um, in communities because what, what you don't want is people simply leaving with hurt feelings and without addressing. That happens regularly, every day, all the time. But this is really something uh, I would recommend to put on the agenda at a very early stage to make sure that anything that makes people feel uncomfortable gets addressed. And I will get to how this can be addressed also in a second, because um, I, 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 I regard that as one of the core aspects of community life. Also, um, creating a framework for participation. How do you enable participation? And participation for me is How can I look at documents? How can I follow discussion threads? How can I maybe leave a comment? And therefore, I just have given the example of Lumio. This is, um, it's a piece of software that grew out of uh, activist communities. And basically everything that those communities came up with is sort of got, got reflected in the software. Um, I can really recommend it. It's um, it's actually it's it's you have to you have to pay for a license, but there are also options to get the software um, as a um, uh, uh, as a as a test, or also for nonprofit organizations, you might also get it for free if you let them know why you need it. But I uh, encourage you to look at the website because. I think they have a really good framework of not only storing information, but really, uh, um, you know, engaging people in what is actually going on in our community. What have been the latest documents that have been produced? What are the latest strand of discussion? Like, what is what is basically what's what is uh, what's what's really important? What is it that? Um, that keeps the community alive and going. So this is, Lumio is just a, is a nice example and a good starting point for reflection. And then uh, another thing, and that also goes in the direction that um, Nicole was asking, and I know it's, it's also, uh, Nicole also sent me the questions you had before coming to this, to this workshop. And I know um, that I think the question that that you have asked the most was the question of how to enable collective leadership. It was a little bit framed, it was framed in a different manner. Um, it was often framed like, yeah, so how, how can we make sure that the community will, will, live, and, uh, will live and thrive uh, without heavy moderation or how can the community maintain itself and how can it become self-sufficient and all that. And I think this is exactly um, another, <laughs> I mean, you will figure that each of these questions are, are super important, but this is probably also one of the most important ones. And if you ask me how this is possible, my answer would always be, it's all about enabling collective leadership. Because if everybody who has, a, who has decided to play an active role in the community, I'm not talking of passive members. They are completely fine. I'm not talking of members from uh, the, the margins of the community that nonetheless, we have already talked about that, can be important. I'm really talking about those that have decided to engage. And how can we turn them into leaders? How can we make sure that each of them can do things on behalf of the community without being anxious of making mistakes without feeling disconnected because they might think well my contribution doesn't matter 
without um, making them um, yeah, uncommitted or maybe losing their commitment over time. And in my, uh, in my understanding, this really um, involves creating leaders and this is something that I think we all have to learn because at least I have not learned this in school and not in university. This is maybe it's a discipline that that gets more and more important these days and we all need to get better at. And I want to recommend you to look at this for co-op. That's a website of friends of mine founded by Stacco Troncoso and Anne-Marie Utratel um, a couple of years ago. And if you look online, you will find lots of really, really good reading material, lots of great stuff that doesn't only that doesn't not only read well, but also looks really good because they <laughs> invest a lot of time in their design and in, in their visual vocabulary. So what Disco is doing basically is to create frameworks of governance and involvement and community building that are extremely inspiring. And above all is the question of how can we all lead this together? And I like their, I like where they're coming from because it's very much, it's a punk um, component that you will find also in their visual vocabulary. Um, and it's, it's really about enabling and empowering people and pass on the joy of simply doing things in a very self-confident manner knowing that you are part of that, knowing that this is wanted, this is welcome, this is cool, so let's just do it. And yeah, in my feeling, this is one of the most tricky things to establish a culture like that where people actually dare to do it. And then this actually fits really well because, okay, what about unpaid labor? I come now with a very different perspective. What if because many communities start without funds. This might probably not be true for what you have in mind, because I understand there might be uh, the possibility of tapping on uh, European funds for building that. But many of the grassroots um, organizations I work with, they start without any funding. Disco is a good example. If you read into it, you will realize that they started without any money. Supermarkets started without any money. And then there's always this turning point when all of a sudden money has been raised and there's money in the system <laughs> because it can create a lot of problems because that sort of, it, it adds a lot of gravity to the project because all of a sudden everyone is anxious of not being left behind in monetary terms. And the question I'm asking here uh, is, is really how I feel it, how to integrate money in meaningful ways. because. Um, this is not just about allocating money to people, but it's also about value accounting, about making sure people get a sense of the value that you produce. And uh, if you want to achieve that, you need to track the value and the hours that go into a specific task somehow. And then there's a third aspect, and that is collective monetary decision-making which I think is one of the hardest disciplines on this planet. <laughs> I guess those of you that have ever engaged with um, in processes like that, you, you know it really well. Also here, I, have a, I just have a, a nice example. It's called CoBudget. It's also, it's a software that deals with, um, or that, that facilitates collaborative decision-making around money. I can very much recommend you to look into it because it's not just the software, it's also the use that the, the case studies and um, yeah, the use cases they, they present. There's also a lot to learn from that. So the monetary question that uh, Julia just brought up can play out in two very distinct routes. <laughs> it's, it can be the absence of money can be a problem, but uh, the availability of money can become a problem too. And in this entire, let's say, field of facilitation and so forth, people have been really working over the past years on ways and frameworks to really um, keep communities going while at the same time integrating money 
but it's a really tricky one and I don't have a final answer. <laughs> the code of conduct, I think, is, is, um, is at the heart of, of, the, of community life. Because it basically uh, it's, it regulates um, or it's a cert, it's a basic agreement of how people want to be together. How do people want to engage with each other? Which behavior is welcome, which is not? Um, what happens if principles are violated? I think you can all, from your own experience. Um, recall situations where you felt uncomfortable among other people, maybe because your contributions didn't feel respected, maybe you were not allowed to speak up, maybe someone was cutting your, um, your words, maybe someone was very dominant, but then also maybe you could uh, sense that someone was speaking very softly, and you were not able to understand the word. Maybe you could sense tensions within the group and you could not say what it was. Maybe because of an absence of moderation, you could feel the chaos coming up in a group. Yeah, if you just reflect a little bit on all the situations that make you feel awkward in group settings, and I guess each of you have stories around that. And we could easily have a half day session just on that. It's super interesting. I'm so sorry we can't dive deeper into it because the format of this workshop doesn't allow, but just take, take some time, you know, and, and really think of the good and the bad things um, of how you felt in community, of in community settings, because also in the contrary, you might have felt really good and you even might have felt that these people feel like family, or you might have even fallen in love with your group of people because they are so empowering and they, they can really listen. And you feel a lot of trust for them, etc., etc., etc. So there's all sorts of feelings. And what the Code of Conduct tries to do is to, is to write down basic agreements that members of a community find important. And it goes without saying that the code of conduct is something that is in a state of flux. It can always change, but it's something that is very much needed, whatever you do. So here on GitHub, you find um, good examples of code of conduct, and it can be very inspiring for you to check this out and maybe adapt it for your own project. What I want to point out is the facilitation style. And the facilitation is something that I guess you have, all, you have also uh, experienced before. So facilitation can be many different things. It can be uh, modes of moderating, but it can also be certain ways of engaging people. If you want to learn a little bit more about holacracy, sociocracy, liberating structures, um, theory you, art of hosting. There are, I don't know how many uh, really interesting approaches. Uh, you can check the Supermark website if you like. Um, there we have, uh, we have organized a series of events that was called Facilitate Change. And in Facilitate Change, we have uh, every month, we have presented a certain approach um, of facilitation and you can just have an overview. Um, and this is also something I, I just wanna bring to the table that the mode of facilitation is super important for um, any community as well. The harvesting and documentation is something that I found that we at Supermarkt are very often not really good at because uh, we didn't really have either the time or the funds to really document. But for me, this is getting more and more important. Um, how, how, can you, how can you capture the moment of what has been said? How can you make um, things available for those that have not been around? And I really think this is key. This is absolutely key 
to finding forms of enabling collective learning, because that's what harvesting and documenting is all about. Uh, sharing knowledge with everyone and enable um, the creation of a shared repository of, of knowledge. Um, one thing is also really important. I have experienced that when I, when I once participated in several book sprints and a book sprint is a methodology of where a group of people writes a book within three or five days. So there was always this interesting question, if someone comes and wants this book to be signed, who is actually allowed to sign on behalf of the group? Um, what if someone walks away from the group and capitalizes on the work that has been collectively done? This is also really, really tricky. And I would also encourage to invest a little bit of thinking into um, who might talk on behalf of the group uh, and how, how can we organize the capitalization of collaborative work at all? Is it possible to do it? Because maybe sometimes you will find that it's, maybe you find it's not, it's not possible at all. And then um, it's really the question on um, what to do with it. <laughs> but it will come up at some point when people have a sense of that there is always the same people taking advantage of what has been produced in the group. So they will develop uh, a certain sensitivity towards that. The un and offboarding, um, I would say, uh, as, as one of the last thoughts, is, a, is an absolutely basic uh, um, thing because very often we don't, yeah, especially when a community grows, we fail at putting ourselves in the feet of people that join a community for the first time. Uh, what people need is, is an onboarding process where they, um, where they find a person that can act as a, you know, as, as a partner to really get them on board. They need a clear uh, guideline to where they can find resources, they need to find access to a governance book, et cetera, et cetera. So this is super important. And the same goes with offboarding. And this is what I said in the beginning. <clears throat> One of the worst things is if people simply feel misunderstood and they have the feeling that, oh, that's not for me, and then they leave. And this has this just a waste of time for everybody. And it's also very disappointing and discouraging. So in order to, um, to avoid that as good as possible, really thinking of ways how to, how to enable people to provide feedback and how is it possible to, to be leaving for good, to also put that as an option. Because there might also be the possibility that people figure, oh, this is super interesting, but I, right now I don't have the time because I have to hand in my PhD uh, or my master's uh, uh, dissertation, like for the next six months, I won't be able to, to, um, to do much. But then uh, it could be really interesting to sort of um, uh, change in hibernation mode, leaving the community temporarily, and you might want to come back at some later point. There are a lot of creative ways of organizing um, modes of, um, or, or let's say levels of involvement also on a timely basis. Um, but this is also something I just wanna um, remind people of. It's not just the onboarding, it's also the offboarding that is really important. <laughs>